Hello, everybody. It's Chapo coming at you Monday, November 21st. And uh, before we start the show today, I, I just feel like days like today, I find it hard to start the show and uh, start talking shit, getting into the riffing and having fun because of events that cast a pall over anything I could possibly say. So at the same time, I don't feel like I can turn away from uh, grief and anger. So I've thought about this all morning and tried to sort of jot down the way I feel right now. So uh, I'll just begin the show by saying this. On a recent episode, I said that uh, the right wing's libs of TikTok midterm election strategy didn't pan out for them. And uh, while it may be true that it has failed politically, it is certainly having its intended effect, which is the murder of gay and trans people. Uh, Whether it's uh, libs of TikTok, uh, Christopher Rufo, Matt Walsh, you know the rest. Uh, there's absolutely no point in spending even a second engaging with their the whole who me and how dare you politicize this tragedy routine that they're all performing at the same time now. But suffice to say, every politician and media figure who boosted rhetoric about grooming, drag queen story hour, and slandered gay people as pedophiles, uh, they do it because they think it'll gain them money, clout, and political power but also because they know it will lead to atrocities exactly like what happened in Colorado Springs yesterday. Uh, We know who these people are and what they want. They want gay and trans people to disappear from our society. And to achieve that goal, they will use whatever means are at their disposal to dehumanize, slander, and legislate against them to make this country a more brutal and ignorant place towards LGBTQ people and force them from the public sphere. Uh, They have mostly failed in this regard, but if they can't achieve this goal through elections, they are more than happy to fall back on simply reducing the number of gay and trans people who are alive. So rather than focus too much on uh, these cowards and the monsters they inspire to do their killing for them, I want to instead focus on something I was most struck by in the media coverage of this horror, which are the parents of one of the victims of the Q nightclub shooting, a trans man named Daniel Astin. Uh, there are a couple, Sabrina, Sabrina and Jeff Aston from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who moved to Colorado Springs, and later their son Daniel followed them there and found a life and community there with them, centered around Club Q, where he worked as a bartender. Now, what struck me was both their incredible dignity and strength in the face of the murder of their son, but also the fact that they knew their son was trans from the time he was four years old and loved and supported him for his entire life. They always knew who their son was and never doubted it. And uh, what I'm stuck with is that this is exactly what these people, and I'm not even going to speak their names anymore, you know who they are, want to make impossible for queer and trans people. Having parents that love you, friends, a job, and a life. Their goal is to take that away from you and they'll do anything to make it happen. So it's the duty of all of us, the majority of decent people in this country, to stop them to fight this evil, and I'm not talking about banning someone's social media account. I'll just leave it there for now and end this train of thought for whatever it's worth by sending my love and support to Colorado Springs and everyone else who feels sadness and anger this morning and today. Okay. Pause. Try try to move on from this, but I guess I'll uh, begin today with uh, the footy. The World Cup is going on. Uh, News continues. Life goes on. Tough, tough segue. And I'm sorry for this, but... I I have a transition. Okay. Okay. Uh, Check this out. Seems like everyone today is buying slaves. (laughs) But it also seems like the Qatar soccer team should have bought some soccer playing slaves. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, nailed it. World, oh, thank, thank you, Felix. <laughs> Got thank you, you guys. so much for that. All right, I, this is a B side I was working on. If you guys want to hear it, yes. Okay, it seems like everyone is buried alive in the holidays, <laughs> but it also seems like several Southeast Asians are buried alive in the soccer stadium where Qatar's soccer team will bury their wives alive after they lose more games because they're not very good. And they have slaves. They're going to kill their wives. Uh, <laughs> um, this is uh, oof, uh, this is some Orientalism on your part, Felix. It's I'm not sorry. a good look. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'll tell you who's not who's not doing Orientalism. He's uh, the uh, the president of FIFA, 
I, I swear to God, I learned this today. The president of FIFA is a, is a guy named Gianni Infantino. <laughs> yeah, Johnny Baby. Um, Johnny Baby. Hey, Johnny Baby. So, yeah, he did a, he did a Cuomo thing. I think this yes, is just something that, like, all Italians <laughs> do when they're in positions of power. I, I think the Medici's did this uh, when they would get the when they would get yelled at. They would they would do this. They would be like, I'm I'm a I'm I have the plague. Yeah, uh, Machiavelli has, <laughs> Machiavelli's The Prince has a whole chapter about this, about how when yeah. a prince gets yelled at too much, he says his stomach hurts yeah. and the people can't be mean to him. Yes, he is not doing Orientalism. He is doing um, a Cuomo-ism. So from Johnny Baby, uh, he says at a press conference, today I feel Qatari. Today I feel Arab. Today I feel African. Today I feel gay. Today I feel disabled. Today I feel a migrant worker. <laughs> these were that Penny does. These, these are these are the migrant worker. These are the new lyrics to Smashing Pumpkins today. <laughs> They've updated them. They've gone woke. Today I feel uh, gay. I mean, I, I've I've been enjoying watching the uh, the start of this World Cup because it's just like just the fact that they let Qatar do like just host this World Cup, um, uh, like literally built on the skeletons of let's see. 6,500 migrant workers from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka have uh, died constructing this World Cup stadium or just the entire World Cup thing for Qatar. I mean, I was just watching it on TV now, and there was this sort of ad for Qatar where they were like, hey, we're, we're an American military base. Hey, we have exciting medical technology. We're the future. And they show a time lapse of the creation of the World Cup stadium, and it was just like, I'm seeing like a couple thousand people's lives get snuffed out in real time. Yeah. yeah. Just a sped up version of that. So Qatar, Qatar has always had a more sophisticated media operation than any of the other Gulfy countries. Like Kuwait has never really had a terrible one. Kuwait's has always been kind of good. Saudi Arabia's is very blatant. Up until about a few years ago, Saudi Arabia's entire media operation was one uh, news organization and then paying 20,000 people to scream, it's an eternal affair at you if you talk about <laughs> beheadings on Twitter. But Qatar, you know, they've had the preeminent Middle Eastern uh, media organization, Al Jazeera, a very respected media organization. They've had, for how small of a country they are, they've um, achieved enormous influence. They're, they're very uh, sophisticated diplomatically. And here they showed a little bit of that sophistication. I think that they've been paying influencers to tell people that it's Orientalist to, <laughs> criticize, to criticize the, uh, you know, slave to World Cup where there are no alcohol sales. I really I do think that because I saw a tweet decker, a tweet decker, you know, one of those guys who all all he ever fucking tweets, all he ever says is like drinks out of coolers are just better. <laughs> when you went to school in a school bus, you knew it was going to be a good day. When you had orange juice in the morning, you knew it, you knew it was good. You know, that type of shit. Uh, like, oh, like when, when, a girl, when a girl double texts you, you know, oh, damn. You know, that, that type of posting shit. Posting a photo of like a plate and knives and being like, how many of y'all remember these? They went crazy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like a picture of Gushers. Who remembers eating these? Um I mean, it's never posted about Orientalism or Islam or really anything outside of like deck chairs and, you know, watching Beast Wars, I guess. <laughs> um, he said most of the criticism of Qatar is rooted in Orientalism. And it's like, who fucking gave you that line? <laughs> Taught <laughs> you that word. Told you that. Yeah. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> but I've seen a lot of that. And I, re I really do think it's, you know, how cheap is it to buy a tweet decker? You know, it's going to cost nothing. <laughs> I do wonder, are there any Americans on the payroll? Like, did they send a helicopter to pick up some, like, Tumblr person who, like, bullied a bunch of people in the Steven Universe fan art community into suicide a few years ago? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, and they no, taught him all the lingo? It has to be, it has to be like, a, a, a Tumblr criminal, like someone who has run off Tumblr for causing too many suicides. And that's like, <laughs> that's like auto, like America hiring auto scores any to teach their special forces. <laughs> it's, it's like an operation paperclip for people who killed 30 people in the Steven Universe community. Oh, uh, so yeah. Uh, so if it's not the, uh, if, if it's not their like, uh, 
the the sixty five hundred migrant workers who uh, died uh, being enslaved by Qatar for this World Cup. By the way, uh, total death toll is probably significantly higher uh, because as these figures do not include deaths from a number of countries which send workers larger numbers of workers to Qatar, including the Philippines and Kenya. Deaths yeah, that occurred like they, in the final the months records. of twenty twenty are also not included. They got the records of these people because their countries fucking keep records. It's like the yeah the diagram where like the the parts of the plane that got shot up are supposed yeah. to get all the uh, yeah. all the plating. It's like no, it's the spots you can't see. So it's like it's got to be way higher. Yeah, I and, mean, yeah. Southeast Asian guest workers and guest workers from all over, from African nations, from you know usually very poor nations. That's the commonality are treated horribly all across the Middle East. Uh, it's not just Gulfy countries. They're treated awfully in places like Lebanon, in, in Levant nations, all over. But um, they seems they see, there seems to be a very futile institutionalization of the treatment of uh, of migrant workers in these Gulf countries. Everyone seems to have the same procedure of you know taking people's get uh, uh, passports, of making sure they can't leave, and essentially doing everything you can do to make it so that like yeah, their deaths aren't even recorded. They were never even really people. Yeah, it's essentially the ideal form of immigration that any country's ruling class would inf- impose if they could. Mm-hmm. And yeah. in, in these countries that have no other class, really, because of the way that the wealth is distributed, uh, they just are able to do that. Like it, it's what we're seeing there in Qatar is just the as we've talked about for this entire show's run, the mask falling off. Right. Like instead of having the World Cup in a country that has hyper exploitation, but has kept it really outside the country. Right. Because it's. Has a, it's, uh, it still has like those working and middle class political, you know, uh, formations that, that there's people that need to be served one way by the state. And so all the real exploitation is outside of the country or is not under like the public, uh, uh, it has not been publicly validated. Now in Qatar, at the end of this, where it's like they can just pay to have the fucking World Cup, it's like, yeah, yep. no, you're going to watch slavery c- carry, uh, be carried out in public. And extend it even to the fucking people in the stands. Yep. Because okay, there, of this there horrible, alienating, fans. monstrous World Cup, people don't want to go. And so they're yep. literally importing from these same countries people to watch the games <laughs> in the stadiums <laughs> their countries died making. This is like, uh, this is, it's, the, it's, it's capitalism totally detached from any of the human institutions that are supposed to be served. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be serving. Like it's not about sports. What is what is a fandom? Any of the things that people are supposed to care about? Totally non-present. It's just money watching itself, and then be, literally hiring people to be paid to watch it. Because if there's not a fucking, uh, uh, if there's not some sort of wage relationship, what's the point of being there? And not sports. This is something I always thought about in about like 2008, 2009 uh, during during the Great Recession was that these Gulfy countries probably had the greatest cash reserve, the greatest collection of liquid assets uh, out of any family, out of any non-corporate entity on earth, out of any non-hedge fund. But it seemed like they, in 2007, 2008, it seemed like while they did have influence and they did have some institutional presence and things like, you know, the Council for Foreign Relations, they hadn't really been part of a global monoculture. And I thought, that's so that's so weird, you know, that they have such they have such great wealth and it's so liquid, but they're not really they're not really part of this thing yet. When will things get desperate enough that they can buy their way in? And now we're seeing it. Yeah. Right. Right. At a time where it feels like we're at the end of something. Every like every organization, whether it's like, you know, a sports craft organization like FIFA or more governmental bodies, these countries, because they're immense liquid wealth have been able to buy their way in it's yeah it's like the end of formalized it's the end of capitalism as like a machine powered by like the collective interest of a ruling class the individual like nodes of capital are so overwhelming now are so out of proportion to every institution that they get to dictate independently so the qataris get to buy the world cup fucking elon musk gets to buy uh twitter and the things that are that these uh, this money is supposed to, to facilitate sports communication are totally obliterated by the individual psychotic interests of this small group of weirdos in the Gulf or this one psycho uh, uh, in America. And we're just at the point where the system is deteriorating because even at the top, these things are able to operate independently of any greater 
interests cult socially uh, that would keep the system at, uh, uh, going. Like it's t- the termites eating into the fucking thing. I mean, and every institution is just being destroyed by them. FIFA, corrupt, disgusting. Nobody trusts it. American colleges to just to have a little. Oh my uh, god! The little fu- segue oh, here. FanDuel. FanDuel. Caesars. Uh, the, uni- the University of uh, Wisconsin, brought to you by FanDuel. Yeah, with a capital- majoring in gaming history and theory, <laughs> and slot machines in the fucking <laughs> cafeteria. Matt, that that story genuinely shocked the me. The Harvard I don't, I don't the Hotel be. Casino. I mean, it's it's the end. It's like the money is there. Where else does the money come from? No public wheel. Get the fuck out of here. But the demands, the the, the fucking maw that modern uh, uh, higher education is. All those administrators. All those well-positioned people making six figures and having a disproportionate political influence, they got to get fucking paid. And what's who's left to pay them? Fan duels and fucking DraftKings. Gambling. So they yeah. will. I want to get to the, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the university gambling sponsorships. But just to go back to Qatar for a second, this is just a, a sort of a, a, a statistic that provides, brings into vivid relief uh, what you and Felix were just talking about. Uh, Qatar is smaller in total area than Connecticut and with fewer people than Kansas, easily dwarfed by the 17 countries to previously host the World Cup. There are 3 million people in the country, but only 300,000 of them are Qatari citizens. Yeah, no, that, that is that's known as uh, the Kuwaiti ratio. <laughs> Kuwait had a similar ratio. I, t- um, I I've heard that they've made more people citizens, so I've never confirmed that. Yeah, just back to go for Tatar for a second. Um, and another another aspect of this World Cup that's been been fun has been the fact that uh, Anheuser Busch Budweiser sponsored uh, this World Cup for something like I don't know seventy million dollars or even otherwise it's seven hundred million dollars for an astonishing amount of money to uh, sponsor this World Cup games. And uh, Qatar has banned the sale of alcohol in the stadiums, which has led, I think, to some... Uh, to an, uh, this World Cup has already had its own Let's Go Brandon moment. Did you guys see this? No. This was during, this was during the, uh, the Ecuador ge- uh, match against Qatar, which they won. And uh, the Ecuadorian fans in the stands were chanting, Caremos Cerveza! And the Fox broadcast said that they were chanting, si, se puede. <laughs> um, uh, did you see um, uh, weird Mike Cernovich uh, saying that he supports the banning yeah, of, of course the alcohol he does. sales? Just, just convert, Mike. Matt, Come once on. again, you were totally, he is but a few words away from just saying the words. He's going to say the words. There is no God but God. Yep. There mm-hmm. is no God but God. Wahhabism, it's just, come on it's in. Coming, the water folks. is fine. The Jordan Peterson is going to be, I think, the last holdout, but he's out. He's it's ticking clock. We were also t- treated to, I don't know, like some some great some great videos of some of the fans in Cotter, inclu- including some of the uh, some of the English supporters hanging out with, with like being entreated to like uh, palaces filled with lions. Yeah, last night we met one of the Sheikh's sons and he took us back to the palace and he showed us he had lions and everything. Basically, we were um, obviously on a bit of a hunt for some beers. And um, he was like, yeah, yeah, we saw beer, saw beer. So we jumped into the back of his um, Toyota Land Cruiser, ended up in a big palace. And um, we were in the back, he showed us his monkeys, his exotic birds. And they're just uh, on a hunt for some beers, and they end up in a, a, a palace with a lion. So uh, right on to the Scousers in uh, Cotter right now. My, my favorite thing, uh, like sort of linguistic trick that we've seen around this is you you saw a little you saw the start of this a little bit in Brazil when people criticized uh, Bolsonaro for clearing out the uh, the, the rainforest, where very right wing or authoritarian or in this case feudal nations adopt almost like Maoist English to defend themselves, where these like hard right or yeah countries literally ruled by an emir will if you criticize any practice they have we'll start talking about like periphery nations and and like it, it, it just it, like it sound like there's someone from like the marxism listserv in 1993 i saw i saw um uh robbie williams people criticized him for uh for going and some qatari elements uh, defended him by pointing out like oh he's english you know colonialism's bad which yeah certainly there's in a in a morally rigid world you know england or america for that matter has no room 
to morally criticize Qatar, I'm sure. And Robbie Williams, uh, as an aside, he said, if I couldn't perform anywhere where there are human rights abuses, I couldn't perform in my kitchen, which raises more questions than it answers. <laughs> but I, I, I think I, that defense is always so interesting to me where they start talking about like colonialism and neocolonialism and sometimes even like mental colonialism because all of these countries, they're all part of the GCC, NATO, uh, uh, Council for Foreign Relations blob. Like they're all like you're they, just because you talk about colonialism, you're you're still part of that thing. You still are partners with America. There's still an American military base here. You still shared goals with American intelligence in Syria. What the fuck? What kind of fucking defense is this? It's the same thing with. Uh, Bolsonaro talking in that talking in that way when you know his presidency was literally given to him by the American justice system. See, but here's where culture war gets to play its role because how do you make sense of this? Like you're part of this Borg that you're defending, that you're uh, saying you're being opposed oppressed by. How are you being oppressed when you're a part of it culturally? Like the the global homo is imposing this uh, this behavioral standard on you. And then you get to, even though you're part of this machine and you're a monstrous uh, 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 thugocracy that like that d- just has no real democracy, any of the things that y- you claim uh, to respect, it at least holds on to a vision of like social order that is, you know, based on coercion. And that is the promise to the extraction capital that is seeing like the total end liquefaction of you know, the economy of the world system under capitalism, the ones that are freaking out about it are the ones who are scared, not about becoming, you know, rich guys in a bubble surrounded by robots. That's fine. But by be- being gay in the bubble, that, by, yeah. by having their vital essence and sense of self being d- destroyed from within by the decadence of idleness. That, you know, it's like a, a, if a guy with a based Twitter account, if people found out that he worked for like Facebook or George Soros and to defend himself, he said, well, you know, in coercive capitalism, I have to I have to work within this system. I have to work work within, you know, the global homo neoliberal whatever system. But it doesn't matter because I'm retaining my cultural basedness. Yes, exactly. It's and a blown up version of that. All the all the gripers and all the American right wing are going to gravitate towards a vision of society that is basically a Gulf monarchy. Like that is the, their vision of because what is what is the model? It is hyper techno uh, uh, a libertarianism, right? No taxes at all. Uh, basically free God citizens who would reign over people without fucking citizenship at all under a, a, a civic code that applies to all of them. But of course only really applies to those who don't have the money to have their own private indulgences, the way that the aristocrats used to be and the way that you can maintain a coherent society, even in the bubble, the thing that they're afraid of losing through decadence. And so they're all going to adhere to that vision. Like, the big hump is going to get him to accept Islam, but I think it's inevitable, as we're seeing at the fringes. Uh, and that that's like the thing that aligns every facet of capital that is like imagining itself in insurgent resistance to globo homo. Like that is the vision they're there in their heart, even if they don't know it, that they're moving towards. Well, I, I, I said I wanted to return to this, but as long as you're talking about um, uh, capitalism, sports and decadence, I do want to briefly mention this New York Times article from over the weekend uh, headline, how colleges and sports betting companies Caesarized yeah. college life. In order to reap millions of dollars in fees, universities are partnering with betting companies to introduce their students and sports fans to online gambling. And I suppose like, I know like, I've talked before about how like it happened so quickly that like I almost didn't notice it, but still I'm, I'm still somewhat shocked by it every time I, I watch like a professional sports game on TV that like every single commercial is just entreating you to gamble on sports, like which used to be the province of, you know, the mafia. You couldn't um, say but anything. Now, but now college, college athletics, I mean, like it, we, I guess I shouldn't be surprised at all that they're following suit and shoveling their students into the maw of, hey, p- place your first bet. You got a thousand dollars on FanDuel or whatever. But the one thing they will not allow is for the for the the honor of their sporting programs to be undermined by paying students. Oh yeah, yeah of, of course. course not. Yeah, we got <laughs> will... some fucking dignity around here. I will say, okay, a little bit, a little bit in defense of sports gambling, it's certainly more, it's certainly closer to what you would want out of something that is a real 
equity or real derivative than crypto. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh I, will, I will say there are more fundamentals and information you can get than crypto. Like, uh, we did. Uh, what did we learn from FTX? That every single, like, altcoin and everything like that is a Ponzi scheme where they all promise to pay 40% APY and the entire game is just getting out before the bank run. Look, at least at least you could be an ace Rothstein in sports. At least you can find out which quarterback like fucked up his knee. It's a little bit more legitimate. Well, this is interesting because one of the theories as to why exactly the uh, the crypto crash is happening when it is, uh, is that you saw this huge movement of uh, young, you know, uh, guys money to legal online gambling and away from crypto. As soon as crypto lost its veneer of like, no, this is actually an investment because look at the number going up. As soon as it got if volatility went into it and it started shaking down a little bit, people decided, hey, if I'm going to gamble, I might as well have fucking fun doing it instead of staring at this stupid little thing going up all day. I could at least watch a fucking game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, there are some good uses for cryptocurrency. Uh, there are real slot machines where you can win crypto that you can then convert to fiat. And then there are CSGO skin gambling slot machines you can do <laughs> online. I've done both. They're great. But again, if you're a sports guy, why wouldn't you just take your fiat, the money that you can use on everything? Right. And yeah. just gamble on the thing that you like. Yeah, it's a no brainer. By the way, smooth Willie Apollo is taking... The 49ers against the Cardinals tonight. That's the, my lock of the week. And uh, by the way, use code Chapo on Caesars. For, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But, That's not a real thing. But of course, thing. like this looks like a horrifying new low for colleges. But again, you're always seeing it's just a step down a road that's already pretty worn. How long, how long have they been having fucking credit card companies set up fucking tables at like oh, yeah. it, at, at, uh, at like uh orientation you get it to show up at freshman orientation and they're like hi you're 18 you're horny you want to party here's a card that will basically let you party <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah and and what and what is it what you know whether it is steven schwartzman or uh you know george soros or the morgan stanley or merrill lynch whatever fucking pavilion what are what is george soros except the world's greatest sports gambler it's true <laughs> on currency yeah, because he, he yeah. you know, instead, instead of being like, instead of being like, oh, I think USC is overrated this year. He said, Malaysia sucks this year. I'm going to make <laughs> yeah. $10 billion. Yeah. Look, he still okay, knows how to I, make money for every, all the right people back home. And why mess with a good thing? Look, have you seen, if you looked at any tape on the dong, on the Vietnamese dong, you know, <laughs> this currency is washed. Okay. <laughs> Why do you why do you have to go on Charlie Rose? Because they can't fuck with me. Like if I'm on Charlie Rose, like I'm some normal schmuck. I want to read uh, just, just a little bit from the View of the Times article. It says uh, other schools too have struck deals to bring betting to campus. After Louisiana State University signed a similar deal in 2021 with Caesars, the university sent an email encouraging recipri recipients, including some students who were under 21 and couldn't legally gamble, to place your first bet and earn your first bonus. And when University of Colorado Boulder in 2020 accepted $1.6 million to promote sports gambling on campus, a betting company sweetened the deal by offering the school an extra $30 every time someone downloaded the company's app and <laughs> used a promotional code to place a bet. About 75% of college students say they've gambled in some way, including playing the lottery in the last year, said Mary Drexler, director of a problem gambling center affiliated with University of Maryland School of Medicine. Nearly one in five say they do weekly, she said. So, yeah, I mean, this, yeah, this is all, this is all it's a really grim, encouraging folks. sign. But I, I would like to reiterate what Felix said. Better this than crypto. Better Absolutely. this than putting even a cent into cryptocurrency. I, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think that's arguable. I mean, no, I, I just like that there's no fundamental in crypto. I mean, and we're looking at it. It does seem like there was a shift to gambling from crypto, which means it's not like they're doing both. Like they're economizing and they're figuring I would rather have my money uh, uh, in the gambling sphere than and having some fun for God's sakes, making it recreational. But like the only reason the college isn't the only, fun. The only thing that changed uh, between this moment when they're doing this and 20 years ago when they only had uh, credit cards on campus is the legal framework. If they just legalize something that used to be illegal, like, and that is what is left to privatize in the economy. That's why we're going to see this like continued creep of legalization of all kinds of vices, because there has to be more profit 
for the formal economy to absorb the, the, cause like the, the, the machine can't recognize, even though it depends on black market money, it can't recognize it as money. Right. So mm-hmm. it's being, these whole markets are going out of the loop and they're just going to get added, uh, to conti- to create more revenue streams for existing uh, legal corporations at the expense of the illegal ones, the cartels and whatnot, and the, and the poor mafias. Oh, all the guys who used to run numbers, now they can't do that anymore. They're like steel workers. They're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, it's just getting rid of every area that used to be outside of the formal market is going to get absorbed in. I am cur- I am interested in that because, you know, with crypto, there is still like, yeah, there's a use for it in black markets. But I also think that with crypto, what we're obviously seeing is everything falls to the center as gravity takes hold. It will eventually get to the point where, yes, Bitcoin still exists, Ethereum still exists, and even the weirder ones still exist. But you have to get it from JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs. Yes. yes. I, I wonder if there will be some type of deal there, you know? Where it's like, oh, okay, we're going to look the other way when you fucking exchange this with a cartel guy for, you know, (laughs) fucking two keys of Coke or whatever. They'll have to figure something out because it like if you can't use it for that, then why does it exist? Yeah, it's just it's yeah, just deals with uh, Sam Sam bank run fraud. This is a story that deals with. Uh, Elon Musk uh, paying his employees to bear his children. This is a story that deals with uh, Jeffrey Epstein trying to freeze his brain in balls so that he can be an immortal uh, sort of stud horse for the rest of eternity. Uh, This is an article that was in Business Insider last week. Headline, billionaires like Elon Musk want to save civilization by having tons of genetically superior kids inside the movement to take control of human evolution by Julia Black. So, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> okay. So like a movement to take control of human evolution. I wonder how this will turn out. So the article focuses on this very, uh, sort of ambitious, uh, I don't know, teal sponsored couple and their, uh, attempts to sort of gamify human reproduction to ensure that their uh, superior genetic stock dominate the human race in the millennia to come. So I'm just going to begin here. Sitting in their toy-filled family room on a Sunday, sunny September afternoon, Simone and Malcolm Collins were forced to compete with the whales of two toddlers as they mapped out their plans for humankind. I do not think humanity is in a great situation right now, and I think if somebody doesn't fix the problem, we could be gone. Malcolm half shouted as he pushed his sniffling 18-month-year-old Torsten back and forth in a child-sized Tonka trunk. Along with his three-year-old brother Octavian and his newborn sister Titan Invictus, Torsten has unwittingly joined an audacious experiment. According to his parents' calculations, as long as each of their descendants can commit to having at least eight children for just 11 generations, the Collins' bloodline will eventually outnumber the current human population. If they succeed, Malcolm continued, we could set the future of our species. Okay, one thing. Someone did try this. Someone did try raising the perfect baby. They tried raising a baby who never even tasted processed sugars, who never saw cartoons, who only heard Beethoven and Mozart, and all his days were spent in athletic pursuit and eating raw liver and uh, listening to classical music and hearing philosophy. It was um, Todd Moranovich. The quarterback, Marv Moranovich, tried to make his son into the perfect athlete. He tried to make Todd into the perfect athlete by doing this, doing every goofy thing that these people are doing. And wouldn't you know it, by the time he was 18, he completely fucking burned out. He hated his life. And the second that he left the house, he like just got addicted to drugs and became one of the biggest football busts of all time. Oh, don't tell me about it. Oh, we drafted him (laughs) instead of Barry Sanders. Jesus Christ. (laughs) They could have had Brett Favre and Barry fucking Sanders at the same time, but they got Todd fucking Baranovich, that fucking Polak piece of shit. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. Okay. His dad ruined his life. Marv really fucked his life up. But I will say Marv made some amazing discoveries in strength and conditioning science, but holy shit, did he ruin his son's life? You cannot do this to a kid. They're going to, they're going to explode. They're going to explode one way or another. Well, yes, kids are not having eight kids, but here's the thing though. That is what a uh, 
a peasant would do to try to make a, a god among men, right? That's what a block-headed uh, Polak would do. The kind of people whose job it is in life to, you know, muck out the stables of, of the true global elites. Uh, these guys are training their children to be uh, mind samurais. Yes. To, okay. to, okay. to cut yes. through reality with their brain blades Okay. Uh, yeah. and prove themselves worthy, basically, of the machine that they worship. I take it to prove back. themselves take, worthy of the internet. I take it back. You know, knowing that these are Thiel funded people, this is a Thiel project. It is going to be enormously successful. It is going to be <laughs> like all their other ones. <laughs> yeah, uh, like everything, everything he does, like Blake Masters. It, it's it's going Q-Bert, to be that thing that they have, the new internet. Yeah. Qbert, that's going great. Yeah. Who doesn't have Qbert on their phone? It will be. I guarantee none of these kids are going to get addiction addicted to gas station weed. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I would just like to also just pause for a second and reflect on the fact that they named their newborn daughter Titan Invictus. Oh that should God. give you a, a preview you should go about where to this jail is going. If you do yeah. that, yeah. You tr- so there should be a registration system, like in Germany. I'm sorry, where you have to have your name aff- approved by the state. It has to be on an approved list. And if you even bring this shit to them, you should be reported to Child Protective Service. Absolutely. And by the way, if you want to raise your kids to be successful, there's only one method that we know to work. That has worked for all, 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 all of time for people of most classes, for people in most circumstances. At least one parent has to be kind of a bad parent. Yeah, you got to. Ha- <laughs> you can't have you can't be batting a thousand from both sides of the plate. Yeah. You need you need a real uh, three true outcome type of guy with like bad fielding. <laughs> the, the, yep. The, the, the dad has to kind of not know what he's doing a little bit. Well, these, well, I mean, Malcolm at 36 and his wife, Simone 35. Well, let, let's just say that they think they, I mean, they have it all figured out. They are pro natalists, part of a quiet, but growing movement taking hold in wealthy tech and venture capitalist circles. People like the Collinses fear that falling birth rates in certain developed countries like the United States and most of Europe will lead to the extinction of cultures, the breakdown of economies, and ultimately the collapse of civilization. I love, by the way, I love tech people bemoaning the, the collapse and fertility and the, the destruction <laughs> of shared communal spaces in the real world. Yeah, it's like people don't meet each other and have sex anymore. They're just oh, I wonder jacking why. off on the well, phone. Okay. Well, but but here, here's the thing, though. Like, I mean, they're talking about themselves. And yeah. like, like and this will become more clear as the article goes on. But in fact, they are plan not just planning for, but hoping to facilitate the massive collapse of civilization for everyone but them. Yeah, they would like to live it's triage in their time. We got to save the best of us. Yeah, exactly. Their wardrobes, Simone told me later, are meticulously curated to protect the- project the kind of gravitas their work requires. Beneath their thick, black-rimmed glasses, hers round, his rectangular, the couple look, as they would put it, biologically young. I, 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 Talking I, that I, way is normal and cool, yeah. and I okay, definitely would not I, I, back I, I, away from you at a barbecue if you started saying shit like that. Okay, me. I just want to uh, I just want to like underscore. They said their their wardrobes project um, the gravitas that their work requires. So immediately, the question in my head is. What do they? What, what are their jobs? What's their work that's so important that they need to preserve the light of consciousness for another they bleep billion years? On the boot black, I bet. Okay, they, 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 work, for, they, they, they work for Gumly, Fuckler, <laughs> Don, Ding Dong, Zingle Zaggle, and Blooper. <laughs> Together, they write books and work in the VC and private equity worlds. Simone has previously served as managing director for Dialogue, the secretive retreat co-founded by Peter Thiel. While they were so he's just like it- his uh he, he's she's Peter Thiel's like a uh, 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 cruise director basically like she keeps yeah, this guy entertained yeah. oh my god yeah it, it's the middle aged woman from from wet hot American summer but racist yep. <laughs> yeah I'm uh I'm the chief key jangler for keep Peter Thiel I keep him entertained <laughs> I keep him slapping his uh, sticky hands together in glee uh, it says here while they relate to the anti anti institutional wing of the Republican Party. They're wary of affiliating with what they call the crazy conservatives. Okay, I- I'm sorry. Like, not n- not a single jug hooter is as insane as these two no, people. No, you are you are trying to become Genghis Khan. <laughs> yes, but you like are, the you, computer. You, yeah, yeah. It's uh, like that's the thing. It's like they don't want to do the thing. Like they don't. They they think they're trying to preserve the heroic tradition of humanity, right? 
the people who historically rose through the ranks of common people to become notable through their through their deeds. They want to preserve yes. that from the muck just taking over in some sort of horrible dis dysgenic hell. But what they forget is that technology has changed it so that we're not selecting. We're not our meritocracy is not selecting heroism. It's selecting who can be the most hollow, empty fucking slave to the machine. Who is the best at carrying out the will of an algorithm? That does not allow room for humanity that, or, and, and heroism. It's the opposite. It's everything that is shallow and empty and, and weak about humanity reified into a value system that you get to perpetuate because it doesn't require the consent of a bunch of people. It requires you controlling a line of code in a room, in a basement. So you get to then, you imagine I'm saving humanity. You're actually dooming humanity and ensuring the only thing left is this flesh appendage to a machinery of capitalism. These are, Congratulations. these are people. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're doing exactly that, but these are people who imagine that, that like they, they see no conflict in their mind between save, like saving humanity means preserving their genetic future. And they, 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 and they, they, and they, they justify that by thinking humanity is doomed without continued access to our high quality seed. Our great, we got the best seed, folks. Our Wonderful high seed. quality, high IQ genetic stock. To, returning to the article, while pronatalism is often associated with religious extremism, the version now trending in this community has more in common with dystopian sci-fi. The Collinses, who identify as secular Calvinists, Oy. are particularly drawn oh to the tenet of predestination which suggests that certain people are chosen to be superior on Earth and that free will is right an illusion. On. I would they like you to be predestined into a wood chipper. <laughs> they believe... Pro okay, I'm sorry. Secular Calvinist. It's so secular. It is theology. It is the <laughs> theology of capitalism. Born when capitalism was born, in the culture of the 17th century, what emerged out of that was a Christianity shorn of any communal obligation, just a pure bullet of selfishness that could then be turned into a logic of domination of the entire fucking world. And eventually yeah, you can't have the mystical part with God anymore because we know too much about science and we need to know too much about science to listen to what the machine wants to tell us. So we can't be bothered with that spiritual bullshit. We're just going to now create a new God out of our own fucking minds and our, and, and our own reflection. And that's what we're going to pr protect, but it's still theological. It's still a fucking God. I'm sorry. It's not, it's not the product of you doing all the riddling on earth and then looking at the computer long enough. Oh, I figured everything out, which is what these psychos actually believe. Yes. I, I, I I'm so, I'm so glad that we're beating back woke capitalism and we can replace <laughs> it with this new thing, which is Christianity without God, which has never existed before. That isn't just what America is. Yeah. And, uh, yep. and instead of God, you have um, uh, Bloopy. Elon yeah. Musk. Like, wokeness is a religion. Yeah. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Wokeness is a religion. This is a fucking religion. You're just, you guys are all just fighting about what to tell the murder bots in our, uh, our floating, uh, like, uh, cruise ships with the Morlocks in the fucking uh, steerage and the Eloy up on the Lido deck. That's the question is how are we going to fucking uh, how are we going to dominate these people? And the, the, okay. the only question is what what kind of uh, cultural decals do we put on the murder bots? Do we put a rainbow flag on or a fucking totem cop? That's it. They believe pronatalism is a natural extension of the philosophical movement sweeping tech hubs like Silicon Valley and Austin, Texas. Our conversations frequently return to transhumanism, efforts to merge human and machine capabilities to create superior beings. Long-termism, a philosophy that argues the true cost of human extinction w wouldn't be the death of billions today, but the preemptive loss of trillions or more unborn future people. Okay, I want to cue into this part right here now, because this goes back to the Sam, Sam Bankman fried and the effective altruist uh, philosophy that we've been talking about over the last couple episodes. So a big part of effective altruism, if you look into it, is this buzzword long termism. And I think that uh, the author of this piece, I think, just very pithily summed it up. What long term what long termism means is that um, you know, uh, you may think that morality compels you to act upon the pressing issues of today, be it climate catastrophe or global economic inequality. Long-termism would have you believe that that's actually foolish 
and there is no greater moral crisis than the eventual extinction of uh, than the eventual like uh, expanding of the sun and burning of the Earth's surface to a cinder several hundred million years in the future. Or another big problem they think is worth focusing on now is the uh, humanity's domination by Roko's basilisk in so that some AI dominated future. But I mean, like you, you can see you can see the sleight of hand here because like oh you know like normal philosophy would have you believe that like your moral uh, your moral sense as a human being is is should be determined by uh, your own life and the things you see with your own eyes and feel and experience and what you know to be true about the world that you live in no that's just short term thinking what you should be doing is giving um, billionaires even more money so they can save us from the sun burning out a billion years in the future and in fact that means that any goal that that like or any means through which uh, these rich people uh, are trying to save us is justified, and in fact, any effort to limit their power from saving us from AI or the sun burning out is immoral. Isn't it amazing that the uh, two biggest threats are both things where you have to give these people all your money and resources and power? Yeah. That it's AI and the sun blowing up. Yeah, because the because this is just like the the Qataris or Elon Musk. It's it's all part of the same phenomenon of the wealthy becoming able to detach themselves completely from any structures of, of, of disciplining them, you know, towards any value beyond their specific mind. That's why they all either want to be immortal, literally like the life extension guys that we're talking about, uh, or they want to have a zillion kids because they think that their genes are going to then be panspermic and recolonize the entire galaxy. Uh, that's it. But it's, it's, this it's, it's the same as the apocalyptic religious uh, uh, drive. All of it is a fear of death, which is what happens when you have no consciousness of anyone outside yourself. Like nobody else but you is real. And that is how these people live. I mean, it's increasingly how we're all being like bred to live, but because of them being where they are and the lives they live, the disconnection, the, the profound disconnection that defines every moment of their life, they are completely detached. And also, I mean, I, I think another thing that should be underscored about long-termism and effective altruism is that no one, save for maybe this weirdo couple here, but the most prominent proponents of this philosophy don't believe it for a second, contra Matt, Matt Iglesias. I mean, Sam Bankrun Fraud even said as much. Yeah, uh, he's like, hey, yeah, that's uh, all just window dressing. Oh, I, oh, you mean the moral philosophy I was stumping for that basically says I should be allowed to make as much money as possible absent without any guardrails or regulation as quickly as possible so I can save humanity a billion years in the future? Yeah. If, oh, yeah. To, to learn that that was all bullshit and that was just what I was saying to con rubes like fucking Matt Iglesias, Matt Iglesias. and stack authors. It's so... Oh, I love this. This is my... Mm. The, the Iglesias it's, thinks he's the smartest man on earth. And here he is taking just the the most rube like just he looks like a corn pone hillbilly off the fucking turnip <laughs> truck for having this guy go I I believe in a, uh, effective altruism and that means a uh, very light regulation for the crypto industry and he's like look we have to take this guy seriously his parents were moral consequentialist philosophers because for him that means something like he's willing to go out on a limb for them because that's his job in, his job isn't just telling people this stuff his job is believing it Yep. Yes. That's how yes. he generates yes. these takes is he has to believe it in a way that bank run fraud does not. He can just get yeah. zooted and like give this guy a run of bullshit at a bar that means nothing to him. Thinks about a second after he leaves. Iglesias has to hold it in his heart if he wants to keep that fucking DuPont Circle uh, penthouse uh, condominium of him. So he has to get burned. He has to get out. But of course, what does he do? Just uh, basically act like it never happened and delete all his tweets about it. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to being a foreign policy guy now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And you know how we love to compare Every every billionaire now, whether it's a bank run fraud or a Musk or even a Bezos uh, to their, their predecessors, to J.P. Morgan or John D. Rockefeller, or Andrew Carnegie, um, how, you know, if any any half witted CEO of any big bank, if they were given the broad charter that FTX was given, they would have quietly made ninety seven billion dollars in yeah. five years. And we never yeah. even know their face, how. Everything, everything now, everything that the, the new class of billionaire does, it is supposed to look like an advancement. Like this is this this goofy, shitty Todd Moranovich eugenics is supposed to look like an advancement, but it's actually they they took out the part of the Jenga tower that was holding it together. 
Yes. They took, they, 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 it's like Elon Musk ha- firing all the non-essential people at Twitter. The, all, the, <laughs> all, those, all those old guys, John D. Rockefeller, the, the stoic Northern Baptist, you know, why did he not think, oh, why don't I just take God out of religion? <laughs> why don't I, why don't I, you know, why don't I just make myself God? Yeah. Because, because it, having God in it makes it, makes it sturdy enough to last forever. Yes. It makes it so that you, no one storms your castle. Yes. It makes it so that you can build an evil dynasty that lasts forever. Yes. And these fucking dopes are like, wait, but if we take <laughs> God out and make ourselves God, then we'll go even higher. Why don't we build it? Why do we have to? Why do we? Why, why do we here in Babylon have to go to heaven? Why can't we just build a tower that goes up there? What, what's the problem? Why can't we just do that? Yep, they're trying to create right. heaven on earth, and what are they doing while that's happening? Making hell, folks. They're doing yes. it. They're geofying the hell. They're doing geo hell. While they're trying oh to do geo heaven. This is such geo hell. Uh, yep. uh, returning to the article, it says. What these movements all have in common is a fixation on the future. And as that future starts to look more and more apocalyptic to some of the world's wealthiest people, the idea of pronatalism starts to look more heroic. It's a proposition uniquely suited to Silicon Valley's brand of hubris. If humanity is on the brink and they alone can save us, then they owe it to society to replicate themselves as many times as possible. The person of this subculture really sees the pathway to immortality as being through having children, Simone said. According to tech industry insiders, this type of rhetoric is spreading at intimate gatherings among some of the most powerful figures in America. It's big here in Austin, the 23andMe co-founder Linda Avey told me. Rafi Grinberg, a pronatalist who is the executive director of Dialogue, said population decline was a common topic among CEOs, elected officials, and other powerful figures who attended the group's off-the-record retreats. In February, the PayPal co-founder Luke Nosek, a close Musk ally, hosted a gathering at his home on Austin's Lake Travis to discuss the end of Western civilization, another common catchphrase in the birth rate discourse uh you want to have 10 kids who all have 10 kids and everyone is just gonna obey your word forever that's how you're gonna prevent western civilization from falling apart the thing that you started taking apart that's how you're gonna prevent everyone from taking the other tires and putting them on cinder blocks um to quote and every and all of their jobs are gonna be founder Right. They're all, everyone's going to be a founder except for like the few Polish people we keep around like breeding rats. Yeah. Uh, To quote a great man, a true great philosopher, an Eastern mystic, an honorary member of the mafia and Yakuza. (laughs) Your family hates you. (laughs) (laughs) But but really, like uh, they're not like none of these people's kids like them. Oh, God. How really you? you? Previous, previous Eastern moral philosophies would have you believe that the greatest moral good that you can confront evil by, quote, snatching away every motherfucking <laughs> birthday. I will snatch every motherfucking birthday. But no, effective altruism and pronatalism would have you believe you fight evil by, by creating more birthdays. <laughs> billions and billions <laughs> yeah, yeah. of birthdays. Yeah. They're never going to be snatched away. Yeah, the sun is trying to snatch everyone's birthdays. But if we create <laughs> enough birthdays, we can have birthdays out in the stars. But it, it, like all these people's kids hate them. Do you think when they turn thirty, they're gonna be like, "Oh, they name their kid ticking. Invictus"? Yeah. How the fuck? How the fuck are you not gonna hate your parents when they, they saddled you with that fucking lemon? Oh my my shitty par- my shitty parents named me fucking Claudia named me Claudius Titus Invictus, even though I'm a girl. Uh, they made me like eat raw liver for the first nineteen years of my life. I, I can never enjoy anything because of how I was raised. But clock's ticking. I better just pump out 10 kids right now to make them happy. Yeah, it's like, and every and the kids, some of them are going to be founders. Some of them are going to take to their parents' values, and they're going to be the good little boys and girls. And the other ones, though, are going to not be able to hack it in there. But none of them are going to, like, turn to the good, you know, because their lifestyles won't allow it. They're all just going to become different types of Hunter Biden or Eric Trump or fucking Yair Netanyahu, this new like global fail son class of people who can only fail to live up to like the best pretensions of their parents' values. Yeah. Uh, but like all of this, this disgusting, awful stuff that they, they can, they're pulled towards because they never saw an example in their fucking lives of what actual like moral behavior looks like. So they don't know how to, they can't embody it. That's who they are. It's, it's like these people are trying to do eugenics, but of course they are doing dysgenics. 
They're creating the <laughs> yes. worst versions of rich people there could possibly yes. be. Yes. The least capable yes. of doing anything, but letting well, a machine run everything for them. Idiocracy, if you will. Yeah, and, and okay, okay, well, you know how they took the God out of Christianity? They're taking, the, 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 the way these people love to talk about humanity, about how humanity is special, because according to them, even though this is not true, we're the only species that works together as a species. Wrong. Even though, wrong. <laughs> By the way, wrong. Termites. Completely done. fucking completely fucking wrong. But, you know, if you do accept that is a special thing about humanity, yes, that is a special good thing about humanity in many cases. But you're taking that part out. Yes! <laughs> You're removing, you are removing that part. Suppo- the part that you're saying we hated to spread across the galaxy, the part that we're supposed to hold like a like a dying flame in our cupped hands is the garbage. It's the shit part. It's all the worst, most selfish impulses reified by this machine that does all the dirty work. The reason we don't act that way in our daily lives is because it hurts other people and that makes us feel bad. The machine lets that happen out of yep. our rate, oh out of our God. observation and in another room and we get to live in a fantasy world where we're not responsible for that. That's what. That's why these people can't stop talking about Roko's Basilisk and mm-hmm. the Matrix being real and AI. Because the fantasy isn't that they they build something that's so great but so so awful yep. that they're a genius like Oppenheimer. That's not really the wish. The real wish is that the awful machine that runs everyone's life. The problem with it is that they built it. What yeah. they want for the next machine is for a machine to have built it. <laughs> yeah. so there's even less responsibility. Yeah. And so then they get to be just little, little babies, little Wally babies in their thing. And the ones, the, 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 the anti-woke people of this class, they think, no, no, the reason I'm based, the reason I love Trump and, and Orban and nationalism is because if we keep that like vigor, we will prevent that from happening. We'll keep heroism. It's like, no, it's already left the building. And Every, everyone who has those values is a fucking lying piece of shit who just wants to stay comfortable. Alexander the Great is not walking through that door. Yeah. Right. By the way, talk about talk about degeneration and yes. th- things ain't what they used to be. Your Hitler, your Hitler, your Franco is Orban. The fucking <laughs> the fucking night manager of a restaurant. The night manager of a restaurant, a country of three million people that only gets to have electricity because of EU runoff. That's your fucking Hitler. You fucking loser. You're not even getting out of orbit. (laughs) Well, okay, a a few words on uh, that. That's their that's their Hitler. Well, here's their Albert Einstein. Meanwhile, the Collins has said a mutual friend had been encouraging them to fly to Austin to meet with Claire Boucher, the musician known professionally as Grimes who is the mother oh, of two boy. of Musk's okay. children. Okay. Grimes, who follows about four, uh, 1,470 people on Twitter, followed the Collinses while this piece was being reported. It makes sense considering that Musk, who has fathered 10 children, uh, 10 known children with three women, is the tech world's highest profile pronatalist, albeit unofficially. He has been open about his obsession with Genghis Khan, the 13th century Mongol ruler whose DNA can still be traced to a significant portion of the human population. One person who has worked directly with Musk and who spoke on the condition of anonymity for this article recalled Musk expressing his interest as early as 2005 in, quote, populating the world with his offspring. Musk who, has- who else wanted to do that? Who can I think of that had a big old farm in, in New Mexico and a <laughs> big old townhouse and an island? Who else wanted that exact thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, makes that photo of Elon and Ghislaine uh, sparkle just a little bit more. And, uh, and, and Epstein's claims that he was brought in to advise Tesla. Uh, (laughs) Musk has increasingly used his public platform to advocate the cause, tweeting dozens of times in the past two years about the threat of population decline. If the alarming collapse in birth rate continues, civilization will indeed die with a whimper in adult diapers, he tweeted in January. These worries tend to focus on one class of people in particular, which pronatalists use various euphemisms to express. In August, Elon's father, Errol Musk, told me that he was worried about low birth rates in what he calls productive nations. The Collins the Collinses call it cosmopolitan society. Elon Musk himself has tweeted about the movie Idiocracy in which the intelligent elite stop procreating, allowing the unintelligent to populate the earth. That's what you're making. That is the world you're making. He would be if Idiocracy was real, he would be Terry Crews. Yes. <laughs> they would love him. What I mean, do you do? You tweet about Harambe all day. You're a fucking idiot. <laughs> 
shout out, uh, shout out, smiling object. Who uh, the the thing he t- he posted about Trump? Where he was like, "Haha, my I'm a big pussy waiting for Trump to fuck me." That was <laughs> yes, great. Yes, yeah. He was like, "I'm a big wet pussy, Trump, fill me up." Oh my god. Uh, though here's where it gets into the real like Nazi shit though. Musk was echoing an argument made by Nick Bostrom, one of the founding fathers of long-termism, who wrote that he worried that de- about declining fertility among intellectually talented individuals could lead to the demise of advanced civilized society. Emil P. Torres, a former long-termist philosopher who has become one of the movement's most outspoken critics, puts it more bluntly. The long-termist view itself implies that really people in rich countries matter more. A source who worked closely with Musk for several years described this thinking as core to the billionaire's pronatalist ideology. He's very serious about the idea that your wealth is directly linked to your IQ, he said. I mean, he is personally disproving that thesis on a daily basis right now. Yeah, but if just- you if you ever wanted any proof that wealth, and especially wealth now, wealth in whatever it is that we're doing now, is just who was holding the potato last, there you go. I says, um, Musk, Musk's ties to the EA and long-termist communities have been gradually revealed in recent months. In September, text logs released as part of Musk's legal battle with Twitter showed conversations between Musk and the prominent long-termist William McCaskill, who works at Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute, where Musk is a major donor. In the messages, McCaskill offered to introduce Musk to Sam Bankman Fried, a now disgraced cryptocurrency entrepreneur who had donated millions of dollars to long termist organizations. McCaskill never explicitly endorsed pronatalism, and he declined to be interviewed for this article. He did, however, devote a chapter of his best selling book, What We Owe the Future, to his fear that dwindling birth rates would lead to technological stagnation, which would increase the likelihood of extinction or civilizational collapse. One solution he offered was cloning or genetically optimizing a small subset of the population to have Einstein-level research abilities to compensate for having Googling? people overall. You, you, have, you, just... have a, you have your Google gland is going to get enlarged? <laughs> that, that's their genius idea? Can we, I, can we, how about just giving people health care? How about that? Oh, wait a minute. You mean like uh, increasing the ability of like the collective uh, uh, intellect of the entire human race to be you know uh, connected and allowed to you know, bounce off each other and, and create not die. Uh, like new concepts that could not have been created by a single fucking consciousness or a group of people living in the exact same conditions. The sort of exchange that generates meaningful innovation, you fucking scumbags. Like, I, I got to say, though, like we get accused a lot of black pill being doomers and whatnot. And I honestly feel like the degree to which that's true is that I think we're all sort of talking around the fact that like the vision these people have of like where society is going to go is going to come to pass. Most likely they're going to get what they want in the near term. They're going to get their walled garden of techno feudalism in however we want to define it. And then we're going to, and people are going to move in it or fall into the, the, the excluded zone outside the, the fences, the wall. Yes. Well, I mean, there's still going to be people in there who are going to be working more and more exploited, but they're going to stay exploited or get spit out like over time. And, that's probably going to happen, but I I don't I can't just call that doomerism for the same reason that I think these guys' understanding of like uh, the idea of humanity as such dying out as like bad as like a thing we have to stop. Uh, it comes from the same premise that humanity will exist in the wire, but that's the opposite. The humanity is going to be extinguished inside the wire, but humanity will actually be saved outside of the wire. There's still going to be people living. They're not going to be living in lives that are going to be legible to people like us because of what we expect out of the social contract and how deeply we're wedded to it, even beyond thought. But like those lives are going to be human fucking lives and people are going to live and try to live. And out of necessity, they're going to come together. They have to because the, they're because they can't turn a machine on and let it do all the fucking work. Yeah, no, I, I feel, yeah, I feel the opposite of doomerism, even though, if you just listen to this or just listen to like our John candy in the metaverse episode or any of that. (laughs) Uh, Listener, you may be feeling despair, but no, I really do feel the opposite. Um, because a seeing how chintzy and shitty their plans are. Oh God. Seeing seeing how (laughs) little, seeing how little thought they have put into it, seeing how unimpressive these people are like, okay, look, 
if trade unionists were willing to go up against an actual impressive, terrifying guy like John D. Rockefeller, yes. we should not be afraid of these people. Will right. they succeed in the short term? Of course they will. People like this always do. But their plans are so fragile and so shitty and so fucking dumb. And we are so obviously at the end of something. And every move this they is, make hastens the collapse of the thing they're trying to keep. They're trying to protect. They're digging, all, literally right. digging their own graves every moment because, oh, we got to save humanity at the year 10 billion. Meanwhile, you're making the very thing that allows you to fantasize that you're going to keep your sperm around that long falling out below you look at bankman fraud is the perfect example of that he did not have to do that shit but he was right. geeked to the gills just like fucking hitler on tanker chocolate <laughs> yes but all you can all all you can do outside of obvious political activities in workplace democracy though is to retain your humanity. Mm -hmm. The thing these people gleefully rip yes. out of themselves. Okay, okay, here's a great example. You want to talk about people gleefully ripping humanity out of themselves? Sitting around the breakfast table after the 6 a.m. daycare drop-off and morning strategy walk the Collinses take every day, Malcolm Britt allowed a text message from his mother. She wanted to know how he and Simone plan to monetize their pronatalism hobby. Remember, everything is transactional, she texted. Hachi oh machi. Oh During God. a stint at a venture capital fund in South Korea, where the fertility rate had fallen to about 0.81, Malcolm became obsessed with the idea of what he calls demographic catastrophe. He was astounded by people's fatalistic take on it, Simone said. So following up on a conversation Malcolm had broached on their second date, the couple committed to having 7 to 13 children. Because of their relatively late start, Simone's pre-existing fertility issues, they knew they would have to freeze their embryos for later use. In 2018, which they now call the year of the harvest, they devoted themselves to producing and freezing as many viable embryos as possible. Okay, I'm just gonna like I'm just gonna just interject here and say this is the first step. Eventually, like freezing embryos and sperm and all that. And I'm not against like you know IVF or or, or methods for couples to conceive who have a problem or who want to delay pregnancy. I'm not, I'm not attacking that. I'm saying the embryo and sperm farms of these people to soon be followed by the brain, like the brain yeah. freezing and 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 downloading facilities. It is the duty of all humanity to wipe out any chance of these people's sperm, embryos, or brains being preserved for even a second after their death. Yeah, got to wipe that out. Kick out the plugs. The year of the year of the harvest. Yikes. I would I, I would love to see like an Encino man starring Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> he gets he gets unfrozen in the year thirty thousand, and he's like, "Oh, who is ready for bad luck, Brian?" Oh man! And people, 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 people are just like, uh, I don't know what language they're speaking. Then probably, probably like a new form of like Farsi Japanese. In Farsi Japanese, they go, "What the what? It, what, what? What's bad luck, Brian? What's what's socially awkward penguin? Who's and then he tries to be epic with them, and then in this like this this new environment where he's just showing up. Uh, like as he would imagine as a god to the natives instead they very quickly realize oh he's the most embarrassing person on earth yeah this no, guy it, is this guy is oh god and like they're very polite because it's the future they figured that shit out so they're not mean to his face but they he can see in every interaction the pained expressions as they just try to try to humor him yeah in the the future in the year thirty thousand, when there's a one world government that is like in Star Trek run by Stacey Abrams. She's still around. We couldn't get rid of her. <laughs> she, 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 she lost the world popular vote, but she, her campaign, they got a lot of electoral votes in Indonesia. She went really hard there that there is a museum for all people like this, all people who throw froze themselves 28,000 years ago. There is a museum of extinct memers and shit posters in Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> where all and these just, people live and share Babylon B articles. And, 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 the, and the people come and watch them and they're just horrified. They're just in shock. They're like, oh, God. Uh, okay. And they feel so superior. It's like watching a show about the 50s when they're all like, oh, oh look at these guys being casually sexist. I'm better than them. <laughs> 
Uh, it's going on. It says here, Simone and Malcolm then took their data export to a company called Self Decode, which typically Ugh. runs tests on adult DNA samples to analyze what the Collins is called the fun stuff. Ugh. Sitting on the couch, Simone pulled up a spreadsheet filled with red and green numbers. Each row represented one of their embryos from the sixth batch, and the columns a variety of relative risk factors from obesity to heart disease to headaches. The relative part means that these scores can only compare each embryo's risk to that of other individuals with different genetic constitutions as opposed to absolute risk scores. The Collins' top priority was one of the most disputed categories, what they called mental performance-adjacent traits, including stress, chronically low mood, brain fog, mood swings, fatigue, anxiety, and ADHD. The test they performed also provided a risk score for autism, a diagnosis Simone herself has received, which they decided not to take into account. Simone compared her autism to a fine-tuned race car. Even if she struggles with certain real-world situations, she said, if I'm on the track and I have my pit crew and I have the perfect fuel... She can dramatically outcompete other people, Malcolm said, finishing her sentence. Matt, this gets exactly to what you were saying. Yeah, I have the perfectly engineered brain to, 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 to extend my light of consciousness a million years in the future, provided that I have the perfect pit crew and fuel around me at all times. Otherwise, if I hit a fucking, uh, a, a fucking pothole, I'm going to fucking collapse. And also, what is it? It's being on the computer. That is the sole... Uh, facet that you're putting all of your uh, points into your build is completely stacked around that which means that other stuff is not just it's not ornamental man those are load bearing structures of like basic consciousness and you're losing them the Collinses themselves have been called hipster eugenicists online something Simone called amazing when I brought it to her attention Malcolm's going to want to make business cards that say Simone and, Simone and Malcolm Collins. Hipster eugenicists, she said with Ugh, a laugh. Shut up. It's funny that people are so afraid of being accused of Nazism when they're just improving their own embryos, Simone added, after noting that her Jewish grandmother escaped Nazi-occupied France. I'm not eliminating people. I mean, I'm eliminating from my own genetic pool, but these are all only Malcolm and me. So, yeah, she's only doing eugenics to herself, so... Skipping ahead, uh, it just says here, the Collinses worry that o the overlap between the types of people deciding not to have children with the part of the population that values things like gay rights, education for women, and climate activism, traits they believe are genetically coded, is so great that these values could ultimately disappear. Uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they're very concerned about that. Well, this, see, that's, this is the psychosis of a, uh, of a ruling class in crisis. They're, they think they're in charge and yet things keep getting worse. And like that contradiction can't be resolved. So they go insane. And it's, it's some variation of this fantasy about how there's some people out there who, if, if they win, then the thing that matters, which just coincident, coincidentally is just basically like my own demographic uh, aesthetic preferences, really, then, then that isn't humanity anymore. And that can only be, can only persist if your fundamental premise is there's somebody has to, be suffering for my comfort and the degree of suffering depends on the degree of material uh, wealth and what they're trying to come to terms with is less wealth, less uh, stuff to, to hand around, less place, less stuff for, to feed mouths, less food, less everything. How is it going to be apportioned? And you know, and like, they think, I don't wanna, I don't we wanna... can't try to save everybody. We have to save the best, but what the best is, is just personally them. I don't want to make this like too much about like, oh, me, my personal identity are here. But I am I am fascinated with their belief that political beliefs are genetically predetermined because I would just like to provide a counterexample to that. My own fucking genetic code and existence on this planet. I will, take of that what you will. But and also, I'm sorry, as a child of adoption, I, I do find everything about these people to be morally repellent. Like, I mean, like as a moral imperative here, like uh, the idea that like. Uh, you need to have 13 perfect children, but like, uh, you know, like that, that adoption never occurred to you or the idea that you could teach values or that like uh, sort of culture and community are transmitted through things other than your blood and jizz. No, because what, is, what else is there? The other stuff can't be quantified. The other stuff can't be fucking put on a vivisection table and picked through logically. So it cannot be processed. It can't be... It can't be recognized as real, so it gets thrown out of the equation. I guess I'm, I like just a little bit more from this article before we have to close out today. But uh, 
quote, you have to create cultures that reward and have structures for large families, Simone explained. Pronatalist pet issues include everything from increasing housing development to changing laws around car seat regulation. One study found that people would stop having children when they couldn't fit any more car seats in their vehicle. During the coronavirus pandemic, the Collinses tried to raise money for a family-friendly startup town they called Project Eureka, where all community rules would be ultimately set, all disputes resolved by the Collinses. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is like a uh, new Wichita and uh, a boy and his dog, basically. Yes, yeah. This is Matt. That, okay, that a boy and his dog, Jason Robards' character in that movie. What they do to John Johnson is exactly what the Collinses yes. will be doing to drifters in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Please check out at, uh, IQ Jones, uh, LQ Jones, or IQ LQ Jones, IQ LQ Jones. Jones. LQ Jones, uh, also seen in Casino, uh, which was referenced earlier in the show. A boy and his dog, starring John Johnson. Wonderful movie. When fundraising stalled, they redirected their focus to the Collins Institute for the Gifted, a specialized online lab school that is partnering with the Barry Weiss co-founded University of Austin and the Teal-backed 1517 Fund. Musk similarly created a boutique education program, Ad Astra, for his family and employees' children that has since expanded into the online school Astra Nova. The logic behind the Collins Institute reflects their thinking at large. If you want to make the future better for everyone and you could choose to dramatically increase the educational outcomes of the bottom 10% of people or the top 0.1% of people, the Collinses say to choose the 0.1%. Do they not know about the concept of diminishing returns? uh, That seems like a pretty fundamental concept that you you should get pretty quickly in life. That like the marginal marginal value of that at those levels is... How much more good at computers can you get, man? There's other stuff. There's other abilities. There's other places to put some blood flow, for God's sakes. Just read the last, to close out this article. If scientists at companies like Conception succeeded in creating viable embryos out of stem cells, they could, in theory, produce a massive number of them. Combined with enhanced genetic screening, parents could pick the optimal baby from a much larger pool. There's a seductiveness to these ideas because it's very grand, Torres said. It's about taking control of human evolution. As for Simone and Malcolm Collins, Malcolm said, we're trying to give our kids the best shot in life. They just happen to believe that their kid's best shot is also humanity's. All I'll say about this is like, these are fucking rich, well-off, college-educated people. Your kids, no matter what, are going to have about the best shot at life that any human being that's ever existed on this planet have. But they have to keep justifying spending the money. The money has to keep getting spent. I love the, I love this. Yeah, in, in 20 years. Oh, my God, it's a miracle. Our kid self-replicated is upper middle class. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we, 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 we've got to be right. But that they have all the money. They have to spend it. They have to spend the money to feel like they're in control of their lives because they have no other control elsewhere, even though they're supposed to be in charge. They have the same rights that everybody else in America and in the West has to fucking spend money. And so they're going to spend it all. How? On protecting their bloodline. Just their fucking fantasy. They're they're little, um, just like a way to justify just continually doing what is making everything worse, including every other part of your life, by the way, because these people are all fucking miserable. You don't think they enjoy their daily strategy walks? I mean, in a, in a perverse way, like they've self-actualized through like, like moral inversion. They're like these weird sadomasochistic. I mean, it's the end stage of Protestantism. It's the Puritan mind. Calvinism without God. Calvin Calvinism without God. without God. So it's like the Puritans, were they happy? I mean, they, they certainly were motivated. <laughs> they didn't seem that way. <laughs> they were motivated. And, they, and the thing is, to, for them, motivation is what matters because it gets results because that's the way that they've, their brains have been trained to see everything. But that's not the only thing. Locomotion like forward is important, but you also have to breathe in between. And I don't think there's a coincidence that all of these people are gacked out of their mind on amphetamines 24-7 because they're trying to deny the reality of like the pause that defines like, you know, being a- alive. <laughs> they they, they want to deny that that's part of life and something that we can lose. We can just cut it off. Like it's not as vital as the things that we uh, like the the compression moment, the, the, the will forward. <laughs> to quote viral video sensation, short angry man yells at busking trumpet player. A and true artist respects the science which serves as the basis of creativity, creativity. sucker. <laughs> it's true. And capitalism does not allow that silence. The only silence I would like to experience is just when all the monitors go boop 
at the oh, yeah. brain, balls, and sperm freezing facilities of yep. these absolute freaks. Yep. Humanity, if we are to survive the next thousand years as a species, I simply will leave you with pull the plug on <laughs> the brain, balls, sperm, and embryo breeding facilities of these sick fucking freaks. Yeah, deny them their fantasy. We're all in this together, everybody. Yeah. You can't, there's no escape pad. There's like, it's either a literal one for guys like Musk or some imagined genetic one for these assholes. We're all going to rise or sink as a fucking human race, as part of a, a uh, greater fucking biological organism that is life on earth. Oh, here's another thought uh, to consider that maybe the, I don't know, genetically predestined, pre like the, the genetically predestined qualities that these people are self self selecting to replicate and enhance to create the best human being for the next thousand years, perhaps unforeseen consequences or eventualities will arise that make them, in fact, the worst possibly selected traits to survive yeah. the coming centuries and millennia. And in fact, there are many uh, qualities now that these people are now seeking to eradicate through eugenics that will be the key to humanity's survival in the coming centuries and millennia. I mean, if the machine if we shut have off, any hope these at people, all. if the machine shut off tomorrow, these people could not feed themselves. In a literal sense. I mean, and then I, there's a lot of anxiety these people have about that, which is why there's a big, like, trad element to this. But, like, they all understand that, like, the machines would be do the actual farming. They would be gentlemen farmers. They would ease into it like a warm bath. They sure as shit wouldn't have to figure out tomorrow, like, the lights go out. What do I do to fucking put food in my stomach? There's still that, that, those skills exist. Yeah, but yeah, they're being bred out of the, the people who want to be the only people left on earth. So where is humanity then? Where can you be a hero that these people imagine they are when you have to do what the machine tells you to do because you don't know how to do anything else? I mean, that was uh, about as productive a reading series as we've had on the show for a while. I think that this, yes. this, this really, like, in a chilling way, synthesizes a lot of what we've been, uh, you know, talking about and mulling over on this show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's through news, uh, you know, recent current events, or just these... Uh, metastasizing strains of, I don't know, uh, tech utopian thinking uh, that continue to, I don't know, yeah, ch choke out, <laughs> choke the dying embers of humanity that we have left in us uh, out. But only in the only in the walls. That's the thing. Only inside the wire is that. And that's yeah. not where the story is going to be told. That's going to be the fucking artifacts that get picked through. Uh, all I got to say is uh, best of love to uh, Octavian, Claudius, Invictus. Um, just like get into weed in high school. You'll be yeah, fine. Just, just smoke. Just get smoked out. You know, couch surf for a while. That's like probably yeah. the least damage you can do. You're, you're all, all that's going on is your parents are walking backwards into inventing Nexium. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> you can do something else. And... Um, <laughs> Donald Trump Jr.'s autobiography, he writes about how after college, he actually went and was a ski bum in Colorado, I think, for a couple of years. And he talked about enjoying it, but eventually kind of coming back into the family business so that he could, you know, wear a suit and get paid. Uh, and he talks in the book kind of like, oh, I kind of wonder what if I'd stayed. And if he had, he would have been the most heroic fail son in human history. He would basically be fucking Parsifal. He would be he would be like the new Hercules, the guy to be like, yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to have a regular job and like get. Yeah, get very high and like hit on milfs while I'm putting their skis on. He, he would have been so happy. Oh, my God. Oh my can you God. imagine something? He's eluded his entire life. He's he has to be hip deep into fucking elephant guts just to feel something. And it's not it just eludes him. He could have had it in the fucking ski chalets every time. He like. Every time he touches Kimberly Gargoyle's rock hard chest, that's <laughs> he's just thinking about what if I stayed? Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, that, that does it for me for today's episode. I mean, wow. Uh, it's a weird transition, but we, I do think we have to plug the, uh, the new, the, How uh, on Earth? Month, the yearly thing. Oh, yes, yes. Because this is actually, this is, this is, these are people who don't have a subscription yet. Yes, exactly. This, we plugged this on the subscription episode last week, but we have a new uh, subscription tier that you can uh, subscribe to, uh, an annual tier that will be avail available for a substantial discount until Thursday, and then a regular discount of about a month for free uh, for an annual membership to our Patreon. Um, there's more information about all of that over on a 
Patreon blog post that I will link in the description here. But if you want to get a discount on a year subscription to Chapo Trap House, that option is now available over on patreon.com slash Chapo Trap House. And I will just say, we also announced some uh, new series. All that information is in the same blog post. I will just say, because there was some confusion, the annual subscription gets you exactly the same thing as a month-to-month subscription. It just saves you a little money. And all of our new bonus series will be available for every subscriber. There is one subscription. It gets you all everything. It's just a matter of how much you're paying and for what time. And on this show, we talked a little bit about um, Calvinism without God. Yes, if you're interested in what suit. Calvinism was like with God, then check out Matt and Chris's upcoming <laughs> uh, history mini series on the Thirty Years' War: Hell on Earth. Yes, yeah, that's where all this shit was born, and yes. like it's only transformed over the years. It, there's never been. It's never left. Yeah, so if you want basically the origins of uh, this mindset, that will all be contained within Hell on Earth launching January 11th. All right, gang.